When I walk by the United Nations building here in Beijing, which is quite old already, I often think that life is changing much faster than the institutions. And if the gap between these two is getting bigger and bigger, trouble starts. Glad to have you here at Asia Talk in Beijing's art district, Chijiao Bar 798. The United Nations, bureaucratic dinosaur or new world government. The rising nations in Asia, Africa and South America want to play a bigger role and they already have their own ideas about how the world should work together. And even traditional players like Germany want reforms, they want a permanent seat on the Security Council. The global power structure is changing, so how will the United Nations reform? Someone who really can answer these questions is the United Nations head in China. Khalid Malik, welcome to the show. Khalid, welcome, pleasure. Khalid, you're from Pakistan and you're educated in India, Oxford, Cambridge. You have worked for the United Nations for quite a while. Before you took over your current position, you worked for five years in UNDP in New York. And before that, you were the United Nations head in Uzbekistan, which is a quite interesting country in Central Asia. Since 2003 already, you have been the head of United Nations in China. So your view on United Nations changing role comes from a perspective of developing economies. So what do you think? Is the United Nations a bureaucratic dinosaur or is it <laughs> the new world government? Well, let me give you a, a context. When I first got here to China, uh, I was asked a very simple question. They said, what is the UN doing in China? Because you, China has the money, has the capacity, so what is your role? And actually, that was a very good question. And all this time, we've been trying to respond to that question. And what is our value added? What can we do which is good? And it turned out it is actually in three parts. The first part is the UN is the custodian of global conventions and norms, the ways we relate to each other as states, as people. And uh, there, our job is to help China become a full and active member of the world community of the United Nations. The second part was very much what Deng Xiaoping said, that you, you kind of cross the stream by feeling the stones. And ever since Deng Xiaoping said that, uh, there's never been a macro policy introduced in all in one go. There's all been a lot of piloting and experimentation. And over the years, we've been 30 years in China now. To, this is our 30th year. We, chi China has looked to, to the United Nations to try out new ideas, to experiment with how things may work economically, socially, uh, politically. What are these new ideas? Well, for instance, currently we are very much involved in, with China on how best we can advance civil society in China, for instance. And we are working with the Ministry of Civil Affairs, uh, with the uh, National People's Congress on rules, regulations governing that. Another uh, partnership is about uh, looking at land rights for farmers. So all these are in some ways sensitive matters, but necessary matters for a society to move forward. But this is a way how China want, uh, how the United Nations want to change China, um, but China also wants to change the United Nations. In which way? Yeah, I don't think the uh, United Nations is here to change China. China will be changed fundamentally by Chinese leaders and Chinese institutions, and ultimately the Chinese people. I think our role is fundamentally to be helpful to support that change. Uh, what you said at the beginning is quite true. The world is changing very rapidly. And again, I give you some uh, statistics on that. It's not just changing between West and the East, or between the North and South. It's also changing between South and South. Uh, trade between, for instance, China and Africa uh, was about $2 billion in 99. Last year, it, was, it exceeded 
100 billion dollars. Uh, trade between China and India, which people did not expect, was a billion dollars in the same year, 99. Last year, 55 billion. So what you're seeing is a shift in economic links, quite rapid. And that's because of the emergence of China, India, Brazil, other countries. And that requires, in some ways, uh, maybe better systems to res respond to that. Uh, when the China-Africa partnership blossomed and moved very quickly, very quickly we realized that you also need new institutions, export-import mechanisms, uh, funding mechanisms to support that. So in which way United Nations have to change to react to this very, very dramatic change in South-South South relations? At the global level, um, the UN has been trying to reform for quite some time. And as you know, uh, the previous Secretary General, Mr. Kofi Annan, has started a positive reform. The current Secretary General has been driving uh, different issues in terms of reform as well. And <clears throat> each stage of society, each stage of history requires a new reconfiguration of uh, institutions. History never stays still, it constantly, constantly changes. But is it fast enough? <coughs> is, is it changing fast enough? That's a very good question. I think you had uh, early started by talking about um, where is the relative power of nations in the UN. And I think everyone recognizes that the Security Council makeup and the way it's been set up, which was set up in the, in the late 40, in 45 as a following the Second World War. That world is no longer the world we live in. Therefore, those who are on the Security Council have to be representative of the world society we live in. And this has been a very difficult reform agenda to fulfill. Everyone recognizes we need to do something different, but it's very difficult to actually move forward to the next step. What is the biggest problem? Why it's so slow? Well, I suppose in the end, it's fundamentally about realignment of power in the world. And uh, who, those who have it, uh, and those who do not have it, and that's beginning to change. Uh, but in order for the UN system to work effectively in terms of war and peace issues, uh, the Security Council has a very important role to play in these matters. And therefore, uh, its decisions have to be seen to be representative because the legitimacy comes from that. I think that is, uh, in a sense, the challenge with the uh, the whole world has. The UN is simply a mechanism to respond to the world's aspirations. Do the Western countries have too much power in the United Nations still? I think it's the, uh, difficult to answer the question what is less or more. Huh? But what is clear is that... Voting uh, rights, for example? Well, uh, I think what is clear is... The good thing about the UN is the voting rights um, are, in the, for instance, in the General Assemblies, one country, one vote. In the ECOSOC, all the instruments of, uh, of the UN all the organs of the UN, you have uh, a very democratic uh, environment there. The thing about uh, the Security Council is you also have five permanent members who ultimately have uh, a very important vote to play. But I think uh, we clearly the world has to come together to see what's the next step. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is that um, globalization is moving very rapidly. So normally change historical change takes place over, say, many decades, over a century. But globalization is fast-tracking this change. So we have to uh, perhaps uh, be mindful of that. And uh, we feel as a UN very privileged to be in China because you can see this fast-track work very quickly in China in the five, six years I've been here. You can see that how rapidly things are moving. What did you change in the last five, six years? Uh, Again, not what we changed, but uh, what I think the world has changed. We have been trying to make a point, for instance, that uh, China's long-term growth rates cannot be sustained un unless other countries benefit as well. And in that context, as you know, the economic zones of China were very powerful instruments for China's own, own growth rates. So as a result of that, we have now, with the support of the UN, also launched a cross-border economic zone between China and Vietnam to, again, spread prosperity. Because in the end, we all interconnected. 60% of the trade of Asia is with each other, which is quite a remarkable, Amazing, yeah. quite a remarkable statistic. So that means that, uh, as you know, Asia is doing better in terms of the financial crisis. Uh, China is aiming to grow 8% this year. 
Um, India is over 6% and other countries are coming out of it in a sense quicker than globally. Huh? But as they get stronger and stronger, they develop their own ideas, those emerging countries in Asia. So what kind of ideas they are, want to promote within the United Nations? I, I think uh, uh, all countries have an equal right uh, in terms of uh, conveying their ideas and the thinking as to what should be. Uh, the UN is uh, really a platform to bring these ideas together. And it's a platform where common norms and standards are accepted and agreed upon. And I think essential in that is the basic objective of the United Nations, which is peace and development. And the idea is that without enduring sustained development, you cannot have sustained peace. They are very interconnected. So this is why the world has, and the UN in particular, has put so much emphasis on the Millennium Goals, to lift uh, the lives of people everywhere and reduce poverty by half by 2015, all those goals. And those are essential for bringing in a also more just, more equitable and a less poor world. Because it is possible to do that. But at the, at the end, it's all about money. And uh, now with the economic crisis, there is less donor money. Is this a big problem? I think it is about money, clearly. But uh, fundamentally, it's also about the right policies. And, and even more profoundly, it's about the leadership. Uh, development cannot be imposed from the outside. And that's all our knowledge of past development points to that. Uh, it has to be driven by countries' own leadership, on their own institutions. And the world is there, should be there to be helpful. And that's what the UN role is about, fundamentally. Again, um, I would like to come back to these new ideas the developing countries have. Probably you can explain a little more what kind of ideas they're thinking about. What, what do they want to change? It reminds me of a very famous uh, address by John F. Kennedy, where he said that we're all the same. You know, everyone has the same expectations of, for their children, to the same expectations of the world we live in, clean air, clean water. So I think these are universally shared norms and values. And to me, this is the greatest value of the United Nations system, to bring together and promote these universally shared values. And then, of course, to be helpful to country-specific institutions and leaders and people to actually aspire and deliver on those aspirations. Um, if when the world is changing, like for example, and China is moving into Africa, there are also a lot of problems emerging. Um, the Chinese they have different ways to act in Africa. They have different ways to deal with the governments. They uh, don't care so much if the government is a dictatorship or a democracy. Is this uh, causing problems for the rest of the world and for an institution like United Nations? Do they have to change their, their ways of dealing with it? I think it's not a question of... Uh, um, I think one has to look at the issue in the right context. I think when you talk to the African governments and, and leaders, as you know, a few years ago, some 46 heads of government and, and, and state came to, to Beijing. I think, by and large, Africa has welcomed uh, the Chinese partnership. And the Chinese partnership has revived interest in, say, infrastructure, which had, not, which, which had not been given a lot of attention in the past. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, I th uh, in the end, as I said, the, le the responsibility of developing your own country is with yourselves. Uh, partners, whether it's the Chinese or the West or others, are there to be helpful, and it depends how best you form these partnerships. Inevitably, um, because things have moved very quickly in the last five, six years in terms of this growing partnership, many things may not entirely fit. But I, we also, as a UN system, have been helping in this China-Africa links. And we see a very rapid adjustment of practices. Uh, we've been also trying to encourage uh, greater transparency and uh, gain global norms and standards in how you invest, how you create how jobs. How do you huh? try to do this? Because uh, this means that you would have to force the Chinese somehow to, to open their strategies or to, to be open to controls and to monitoring. And that's probably not the way it goes. I, well, I, uh, let me just uh, give you a sense. Last night, for instance, um, uh, Jean Ping, 
who is the chairman of the African Commission and is the, the uh, vice premier of Gabon, huh? whose father, by the way, is Chinese, huh? came from Wanzhou. Huh? Uh, and we were, there was a hosting uh, dinner for him. And what struck me is that how rapidly this friendship and partnership between China and Africa is moving. It's quite, it's not just on the economic side, it's also on the cultural side, it's also on the people to people side. So I think that is a good asset to have. And uh, what we've been trying as a United Nations is to uh, keep on working with Chinese partners and we have helped create a China Africa Business Council for that purpose so that uh, Chinese investors also get to know global norms and standards and expectations everyone has to do the right thing. And you may also notice in the last few years there's been a lot of emphasis on corporate social responsibility in China itself. And I find it quite impressive that, uh, and also the Sichuan earthquake recently where spontaneously people and companies and institutions wanted to be helpful. You have the same spirit actually and when you bring knowledge and spirit together a lot of positive things can happen. And I think in the last few years we see a very growing interest in making certain that they are doing the best for the country as well. How was it for you personally when you um, left Pakistan to go studying in England? Well, I think uh, for this, for, for us it was very much an expected thing that you went uh, for higher education elsewhere, uh, although there are very good universities in, in, in Pakistan also, but I was very privileged that I was able to do that. I had some scholarships to do that. And, uh, uh, you know, there's, there was, when I was doing that, it was, you could see the first stages of globalization working, that uh, uh, it's not no, no longer unusual to have large numbers of people from all over the world study in different places. Huh? But for you, it was quite important in your life. And w what surprised you when you came to, to England? Well, I think uh, what uh, the biggest surprise for me was, you know, in uh, society in Pakistan is a very collective society. Uh, you are never alone in a way. Huh? So the big change for me is not going to England, but just being on my own. And then learning how to be independent and learning how to make my own way. I was quite young. So I think all that was uh, helpful in forming who I am now. There were also different kinds of values in, 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 in England. So what kind of new values you learned there? I think I was lucky to go to universities which were very good on the academic side but also were quite good at bringing a lot of people from all over the world. So what I learned most was really from my peers, from the friendships I made, and how those friendships have retained till this day. And that was to me a, a big plus of uh, having studied in those universities. I think the, as I come back, uh, you very quickly realize that there are universal values. People have the same interests, you know, young people, uh, at universities are very similar in their instincts and styles. Was it by accident then most of your work happened in Asia then? Uh, actually not uh, all of it happened in Asia. The, my career has been very much, once I joined the UN, mm -hmm. there was one position in New York, mm -hmm. one position overseas. Mm -hmm. So I have worked in Asia, I have worked in Central Asia, which is also part of Asia. But you're very much interested in Asia and China, why? Well, I think I got lucky coming to China. Why? And, and um, because uh, both myself and my wife, our families had been connected to China. For instance, my wife's uh, father was in Beijing in the late 40s. So there was an interest in that sense. And Pakistan and China were quite close historically, and also my father was active in that. So I had followed China for some time. And when I got this position, I was very pleased on that and I prepared myself to come to China. But when you come to China itself, you realize that the reality is quite different from what you're told about China. What are the differences? You know, I was told uh, that if you want to write a book about China, you should do it in the first three months. Because after that, the complexity and the subtlety of the culture of this is quite profound. But you didn't follow this advice. Second, I know I didn't write a book in the first three months. Huh? The second uh, uh, point was that many of the, the, I would say the international assessments of China, even though people who had been living in China for a while, was always 
very doubtful about China's progress and growth. So if you look at the past uh, financial representations, each year, next year, they would predict that uh, China would collapse or the growth rates were too high. Huh? They were not real statistics. Huh? Uh, could not there was be a sustained. famous book, The yes. Coming Collapse of yeah, China. Absolutely, yeah. could not be sustained. Uh, yet, over the almost 30 years, China has been growing at 9-10% growth rates every year. So, that is what I'm working on. I am actually writing a book on that. Huh? Why has China now, grown? at the end of your term. Yes. Why has China grown so fast for so long? And to me... Can you answer it in, in a few well, sentences? I think it's very much an uh, issue of transformation. I think China was able to have a long-term commitment to reform. And in some ways, uh, Deng Xiaoping's vision of where China could go is still guiding China. So when you are able to have a commitment to reform and moving forward over a long period of time, something happens. It doesn't mean that uh, at each stage the policies were either wrong or right, but they were generally in the right direction. They were always trying to move forward. And whenever there were crises, somehow the, the system was able to respond with even more reform, which is quite amazing. And I think that was a very important issue. The second thing was uh, the tremendous investment in people. And I think that was quite important because uh, if you compare, say, the Chinese experience with the Russian experience, I was in Central Asia when it became, came out of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. period. If you remember, there was this big bang uh, approach in Russia, which was quite complicated. Uh, you had a package of policy which you introduced all in one go, but then society was not quite ready for them. So I think you have to find ways of connecting society with the policies. And this is why China also took a very gradual approach to change. Is China a model for Asia? I think uh, the growth which has happened in China, in Korea, in, uh, in other parts of Asia, uh, is a very valuable lesson for others. Uh, what it means is that if you are serious about moving forward and if you are determined to work hard, something happens. And I think that's a very profound lesson for any society. Your home country is not so successful yet. Why? Well, I, being a Pakistani, uh, I can only wish Pakistan well for the future. I wish Pakistan well. But uh, you have basically well. three profound mm -hmm. crises coming together. Uh, um, a security challenge, uh, an economic crisis which became very accentuated recently, and also a government which is trying to establish itself. So these three things, uh, China, I, mean, I think Pakistan has also been quite unlucky in the way things have happened. And, but with democracy and with uh, uh, long-term commitment to democracy, hopefully many of these things can settle down. What are the next things which has to be solved, the next problems which has to be solved in Pakistan? Well, you know, I'm, since I work for the UN, I don't want to comment too much. On, <laughs> At least on, it's your home but country. As, as, yeah. uh, as a Pakistani, I can only hope things get better. Huh? Mm. And, uh, and also as a Pakistani, I think um, uh, Pakistanis are enormously talented. Uh, they are very creative. And there are almost 170 million people in Pakistan. So uh, I think they're right energies coming together would be enormously helpful, not just for Pakistan, but the region as a whole. No? Will there be one day a un kind of a united Asia like uh, a united Europe? I hope so. I think I, I really hope so, because the future of the world is coming together. And I think the tremendous progress made by Europe in this uh, is a remarkable lesson for everyone. Uh, countries in Europe which were over many centuries and even longer than that fighting each other be able to come together and prosper together is a very remarkable, I think, lesson for all of us. And I'm hoping that South Asia initially can do that. Will it be easier for the Southeast Asian countries to get together or more difficult than in Europe? Well, I think if Europe can do it, so can we. <laughs> <laughs> and I only hope we can uh, just keep focused on that issue. So um, then you're quite hopeful that this will happen soon? Well, I would like it to happen soon, but um, let's see what uh, reality informs us. You worked quite a lot on these questions, how to get um, uh, Asian, Southeast Asian countries well, together. you know, we have a, I oversee a program for Northeast Asia, yes. which covers the two Koreas, China, Russia and Mongolia. 
And uh, you can see very clearly there also that uh, if, as we help these countries come closer together, particularly on the economic side, other things will settle down much easier as well. And I think this is what I start in the beginning by saying that the Millennium Goals are so important that if we can reduce poverty and improve the lives of people, you know, peace also unfolds itself uh, around that and it can be sustained more easily as well. So will the United Nations be the new world government? Well, I think uh, the United Nations fundamentally is here in a service role to be supportive, to be a platform. Huh? And I know that people talk about world government in these matters, but uh, I think that has to be the fundamental direction of the United Nations. And that's where I think the leadership of the United Nations is also trying to emphasize. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. And don't forget, as the Chinese are saying, Manzor, walk slowly.